In this video, I'm going to share why I think emissions reduction must be a legislated target in the Rupin framework. Malaysia ratified the Paris Climate Agreement on 16 November 2016 and submitted the first nationally determined contribution a few days later. In that NDC, Malaysia declared its intent to reduce its economy-wide carbon intensity of 45% in 2030 compared to 2005 levels. On 29 September 2024, just recently, the National Climate Change Policy 2.0 was published as an upgrade to the previous National Climate Change Policy published on 2009. This NCCP 2.0 restated the 45% reduction against GDP or carbon intensity as a matter of policy. We now have RUPIN, the National Climate Change Act consultation paper issued early October. I've already done several videos on the high-level framework and you can see a playlist here. In this video, we will dive into part 1 definition and part 2 emissions target. Part 1 of Rupin covers definition, which is standard, so I'm not going to go into it in detail other than to say that it is good for the consultation paper to state that the definitions provided are or will be aligned with international standards such as those from the UNFCCC but we won't be able to comment until we actually read the bill and whatever definitions it contains. However, I can say that Malaysia's NDC already contains definitions, so I expect that Rupin will follow that. Now we get to the meaty part. Part 2 of Rupin comprises Section 17 and Section 18. Section 17 grants the Minister of NRES the authority to set national climate targets, aligning them with Malaysia's nationally determined contributions NDCs and long-term low emissions development strategies or LTLEDS, subject to cabinet approval. Section 16 mandates the minister or a designated entity to monitor the implementation of activities aimed at meeting these targets. The key issue here is that Rupin's climate targets are not legally binding. These targets rely heavily on ministerial discretion, policy decisions and cabinet approval rather than being explicitly backed by law. This brings me to the core concern. If there's no legal obligation to meet emissions reduction targets, then there's nothing stopping us from changing the targets or moving the goalposts. While flexibility in targets can be useful, in this case, it's problematic because net zero goals are becoming more critical as the planet reacts to rising emissions. If we're truly serious about combating global warming and climate change, these targets should be legally binding commitments in Rupin. This raises the fundamental question, should a climate change act contain legally binding targets? I would argue yes, and let me explain why. If you're new to the channel, hi, I'm Reza Ali. Welcome to the channel where we rethink sustainability one idea at a time. The UK Climate Change Act 2008 provides a legally enforceable framework with binding long-term targets. For example, in Section 1, it mandates an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 against 1990 levels. This was later updated to 100% net zero by 2050. Carbon budgets are set every five years with legally binding limits on emissions. Rupin, on the other hand, offers no binding long-term targets like net zero and it lacks a carbon budgeting system to enforce progressive action. The Minister of NRES can set targets, but there is no legal obligation for these targets to be met, nor are there clear penalties for non-compliance. This is not just a procedural difference, it's a philosophical one. While Rupin focuses on ministerial powers to set and monitor targets, I believe in a framework that focuses on legal duties and accountability. 
legislated targets create a long-term non-negotiable commitment to climate action, while policy-driven targets like those in Rupin are subject to political changes and can easily be revised or delayed. So why does this difference matter? Let me explain three key reasons why I think legislative targets are more effective than policy-based targets and why Rupin's approach needs to change. 1. Legally binding framework In the UK, climate targets are enshrined in law. For example, the UK Climate Change Act states, Section 1, it is the duty of the Secretary of State to ensure that the net UK carbon account for the year 2050 is at least 100% lower than the 1990 baseline. This creates a clear legal obligation. By contrast, Rupin gives the minister the power to set targets, but these remain subject to cabinet approval and policy discretion. There's no guarantee that these targets will remain unchanged or be enforced over the long term. 2. Legal consequences for non-compliance In the UK, missing a carbon budget means the government must explain the failure to parliament and take corrective action. There are real political and legal consequences for non-compliance. Under Rupin, Section 18 requires the minister to monitor progress, but there doesn't seem to be any enforceable mechanism to hold the government accountable if these targets aren't met. Without legal consequences, there's little incentive to ensure that emissions reduction targets are adhered to over time. Policy-driven targets like those outlined in Malaysia's Climate Change Policy 2.0 are susceptible to political shifts. We've seen this happen in the US, where climate goals set by one administration were reversed by another. Rupin's targets can be changed or delayed depending on political priorities, since they aren't legally binding. This makes Malaysia's climate goals vulnerable to changes in leadership and political will, creating uncertainty for the public and businesses. This brings us back to Rupin. While the bill sets out important powers for the minister, it lacks the binding accountability that ensures real progress. To ensure Malaysia meet its climate commitments, Rupin needs to 1. incorporate legally binding emissions target, like the net zero goal that's already part of Malaysia's climate change policy 2.0, directly into the legislation. 2. Introduce a carbon budgeting system with five yearly binding targets that tracks our progress towards net zero, much like the UK system. And thirdly, establish legal consequences for failing to meet these targets, ensuring that Malaysia's climate goals aren't just aspirational but enforceable. By making emissions targets legally binding, Rupin can provide a clearer, more predictable framework for climate action that will survive political changes and provide the certainty businesses and the public need. I understand that my approach may seem aggressive. I am fully aware that Malaysia is still focusing on developing its economy. Maybe flexibility is important and perhaps my approach could place a heavy burden on the government. Additionally, this kind of aggressive, legally binding approach might be something that our legislative framework and political philosophy aren't ready to handle. But here's the thing. We either believe in and commit to net zero or we don't. If we truly believe that achieving net zero will directly impact the fight against global warming and climate change, then we need to take bold steps. This is what we must do. I also understand, and I've mentioned before, that Malaysia's emissions only account for 0.77% of global emissions. So yes, achieving net zero in Malaysia may not make a significant global impact on its own. It's a tough argument, and I've made it myself. In fact, I've often argued that net zero targets for developing nations are like asking them to develop with their hands tied behind their backs. I don't have a clear answer for that right now. But we have to ask the question, do we want to lead in sustainable development or do we want to wait until it's too late? If you want to dive deeper 
Into my thoughts on Rupin's emissions target mechanism, I made another video that you can watch here and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Should Rupin adopt legally binding emissions targets? How can we ensure real accountability in Malaysia's climate efforts? If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more in-depth analysis of Rupin and Malaysia's net zero goals. Thanks for watching and remember, together we can bring balance to profits, people and the planet. Let's build a more sustainable future, one idea at a time. See you in the next video.